So this is using Vert.io for high-speed container interprocess communication with the Okta project in LXC. And we're going to go through a quick QMI. We're going to talk about Vert.io and virtual machines. And then Vert.io and containers. See that big question mark? That question mark's there for a reason. Um, and then the Okta project set up on how I did, did a lot of this work and a demo, an actual live demo, and some conclusions. So uh, the first two am I, and I'm sorry, Kevin, I should have put a Bay Libra logo up here, but I forgot. Um, my name's Eilish. Most people call me Pidge. I've been a long time Linux user developer. Um, Slackware off of that CD, actually. Um, back in somewhere in the 90s, and I've been a long time Yocta project contributor. I've worked on the Build Statistics BB class. Uh, I've done a lot of the licensing work. I was uh, the second maintainer of the Yocta Auto Builder. I've worked on, I was maintainer for Arts Linux and network grade Linux. And uh, my claim to frame is weird Yocta project demos. Um, the Meta Zephyr MIDI Club, the Yocta powered Vilaru, uh, Yocta project. Uh, DJ sets. Um, I'm notorious for having two noise complaints at Linux Foundation uh, uh, events. So, you know, that's kind of my claim to fame. And right now I work for Bay Libra. Thank you, Bay Libra, for asking me here. And I do mostly Yocto project things. So, Vert.io for virtual machines. Oh, one quick thing. You will not see on this slide that I am a kernel developer because I am not. I know just enough about kernel development to be dangerous. You will also not see I am a hypervisor developer because I am certainly not that. I know enough about hypervisors to be dangerous. I'm an embedded developer, which means I know a whole lot of little things about a whole lot of other things. And enough to put it together to have something that works at the end. So, Vert.io for virtual machines, which is very oversimplified for embedded developers. So what is Vert.io? When we hear Vert.io, we generally think, oh, that's the stuff that makes my VMs talk to my underlying kernel and all that. Yes, but uh, Vert.io is a set of standards to provide virtual interface to VMs. So you have uh, your virtual devices that, uh, from the guests that talk to the hypervisor, that talk through the kernel into the hypervisor, into the host kernel, and then all the Vert drivers are within the guest, and then all data transport happens through vert queues and V-rings that all go through the kernels, and, and it is a nightmare if you know nothing about this to kind of learn about this in the short period of time that I had to learn about all this. Um, so basically, you have um, these virtualized interfaces that um, sit within the guest, guest space talk to the guest kernel, that talk to the hypervisor, that end up talking to the host kernel. And then a lot of the data I.O. is all handled through vert queues and V-rings, and it's all coordinated in three, via the guest memory. So the VM process basically handles all the, via, all the I.O. here. And the data plane basically exists within the VM process. And all this is great, but context switching and syscalls can be expensive. Um, so if I'm pushing a lot of data through all this, then, you know, oh boy, well, you know, I really want this data to go a lot quicker. So a bunch of people sat down and they said, boy, if there was only an exceptional way to take the data path and accelerate it, this is called exceptional data path acceleration or kernel bypass. So what we're going to do is the da entire data plane, all of this, we're going to just kind of skip the guest kernel and just go directly to the host and deal with it there. So this is called the host and virtual machines. So hardware is sometimes fast, except if you're an embedded developer, sometimes it's not. Um, software is almost always slower than hardware. So what we're going to do is we're going to offload the data plane onto the vhost driver on the host. So all the data I.O. is going to go directly to the host, host driver, and then that ends up giving us a little bit of a performance boost. So vert I.O. is still sitting there. And it's still dealing with the control plane, but the data plane, not so much. Embedded developers, if we've ever run QEMU, we see a lot of this happening. And we know that it's there. We may not know underneath the hood how exactly it works, but this is what we know. So 
let's untangle all of this because one of the hardest problems I had learning all of this is that we have Bird IO and vHost and then capital vHost and then vHost user and vHost device and there's, there's a few good explainers out there on what this is, but unless you're really diving into this, um, it's kind of like the, there's people who kind of conflate two terms together. So Vert.io is a standard. It's run by the Oasis folks, and it's standard for interfaces for virtual devices. It's also the uh, mechanism between the virtual machine and the hypervisor and the host. VHost is the guest kernel bypass. VHost user is the guest user space VHost backend user backend drivers. This is a way that we can bypass the entire kernel for, from the guest VM and just talk directly to the host. And DPDK, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, uses this. And then there's VHost device, which is essentially the same as VHost user, but it's kind of cooler. So, okay, most of the time when we're doing vhost uh, user type stuff, it's network drivers. With vhost devices, it's very specific to different types of drivers. The Stratos project uh, makes use of this. Um, they have a lot of Rust uh, virtual machine drivers, uh, so I square C, GPIO. Um, there's some GPU pass through work that's being done. Um, Jake Howard has a really good talk about GPU and LXC pass-through where we can pass through all the GPU stuff uh, bypassing the kernel entirely. Um, but most of this is all focused on VMs. So wait, this is talk about containers. Why the hell am I talking about VMs, right? Because VMs are not containers. A couple of months ago, someone came, uh, well, one of my project managers came to me and said, hey, can we do Bird I.O. in containers? And I think Drew was in that uh, call. And by the way, this is an interactive call. You control me. Feel free. Um, and Drew and I both had the same question. Bird I.O. isn't for, for containers. It's for VMs. Why would we want to use this in containers? And one of the comments I made sounds, is, this sounds like building a cheese submarine. I can build a cheese submarine, but it doesn't make sense. Wait, let's remember, first thing, virtual machines are obviously not containers. The container doesn't have a guest kernel. Data basically goes the same way as it does normally. But we also got to remember what vhost user and invert IO are. There are hardware abstraction layers. This allows us to do kernel bypass to speed up data. So this allows us to do interesting things for things that need data now. So if I need to pass data from, the, from one container to the other container and just completely bypass the kernel, we can do that. So why would we want to do this? And these are arguments I've heard that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I, if, I'm a, if I'm developing application containers, I no longer need to care what chip is I2C, NET, GPIO underneath in the host because I'm just relying on my vhost uh, front end driver and that's going to speak to my vhost back end driver and that'll spit, do all the kernel stuff and I don't need to care about it, which is an argument. Um, I'm not entirely sure it's a good argument, but it's an argument. Um, there we have virtualized access to hardware, which is great, which we kind of had already in VMs, but you know this is a way to do this. Um, so device tree vendor kernels, I don't need to care as much, which is not entirely true, but that's one of the arguments. Um, one of the cons is there's not as much front end driver support here. So if you say, oh, I have like I'm using the Stratos uh, v Rust VMM drivers, I can use those. You're still building you're still going to need to build that vhost front end driver. Um, the one good reason is exceptional data path acceleration. So most everything goes in user space at this point. Now, here's a problem with this. It poses some, see, see the big air quotes there, security concerns, because basically I'm just sharing a, a big mount of huge table and every, all the data is going through there and it's all sitting in user space and that's kind of a problem. Now there's an argument to be made that for an embedded device where people have physical access to, this is less of a concern because if they have physical access to it, 
then getting access to the host is not going to be that big of a thing. And once they have access to the host, they essentially have access to the container anyway. Um, there is some work towards mitigation of this, and we're going to talk about it specifically within the DPDK context, um, which your hair will go a little gray during this because things have to be run as free. Um, so why LXC? Um, <laughs> I'm going to be honest here. Pro, automotive grade, U li grade Linux uses it. That's, uh, it's pretty lightweight. Um, it's not as widely used as other container runtimes, and that posed a problem during a lot of the work I was doing on this, because if you don't know LXC, then you have to go and read the documentation. When you go to Google, how do I do blot in LXC? Then you have to con figure out if it's LXC LXC or LXD LXC, because LXD LXC is run by Canonical and is a very different thing, but it's based on LXC LXC. And if you're as confused as I was, that's kind of how like a month of my life felt. Um, if I wanted to use LXD, I would have to install snaps and uh, stop circumventing pa package managers. Please don't do that. Um, there are honestly better choices. Uh, LXC is fine. Um, I probably, just because I'm familiar with it, would have used RunC or Docker or something like that. There's nothing bad about LXC, but um, it's just not as widely used. So how does Vert.io vhost container support, where does it exist within the Octo project? So um, Bruce Ashfield runs, uh, he's the maintainer for Metro Virtualization. He has the LXC support working, it's working pretty good. Also, the Linaro, Stratos, Rust, VMM, backend, vhost device drivers are in there, which just happened within the last month because I was initially working on these about six, seven months ago, but they ended up getting put into meta virtualization before I got, got to do it. So I'm very excited about these. And a lot of the virtualization kernel config fragments live in meta virtualization. MetaDBDK now exists. Uh, this initially was in within Meta Intel. Saul Wold split it out a few years ago. If you're using older Yocto project releases, you may still need to go to Meta Intel for this. But MetaDBDK is there. It's mostly working. There's still some things that it's missing, like the packet generator is missing, and that kind of needs to get worked out. But uh, the next thing is we're going to tie this all together with my layer, which is Meta LXC DBDK. So uh, Meta LXC DBDK. Um, we're doing multi-config container builds, which is based on a lot of the work that Scott over there uh, has done, and I'm sure he will talk about. Um, thank you, Scott Murray. Um, I forget who the first person to do the multi-config container stuff was. I think it was Paul Barker. Um, so basically what we're doing is when we build a Yocto image, we want the image pre-populated with the container root at best and all the container configs. And this was a problem for a very long time because the way that we could do this is, oh, all right, we'll throw Docker on and do Docker fetch. Well. One of the reasons that we didn't want to do this is that the source of the root FS that we have for the container should be the same source as the host FS. And it should be built from the same place. Um, this is what we do within Pocky Crops, which is the, the Pocky container build system that we're, me and Tim Orling are working on. Um, so I'm pretty sure Paul Barker was uh, the first person to kind of do the multi-config stuff. Then when Paul and I worked together on Oryx Linux and Network Grade Linux, it got brought into there. And then Scott did a bunch of talks about how to do containers within the Okta project. And then he took a, picked up the banner of that and has moved it on to AGL. So a lot of the work that I'm basing this off of is stuff that's been in AGL for a while, and I just ripped it out. Um, Scott and I actually had a talk during uh, lunch about making this generic enough for upstream, and uh, Bruce Ashville apparently has some patches that have been in the works for a while to make some of this work uh, upstreamable. 
Um, there's also some kernel fragments that we needed to do. Config huge table FS wasn't there. There were some friends of that that needed to be there. Um, some of this work should actually be upstream to meta virtualization, which I'm going to do, and some templates, some like local conf and BB layers templates. Um, one of the reasons why there's a local conf template, and it's something I'm not thrilled with, with DBDK. DBDK, the recipe has compatible machine, PN, DBDK equals none. And you have to override that, and you should override that in machine config. But what if my layer is not a machine-specific layer? Um, and I don't know the right way of doing that. Um, and I, I, I'm sure there's a reason why they did that. And I will be damned if I can figure it out. Right now, I'm fixing this in the image. Um, it eventually should be fixed in upstream uh, meta virtualization. Um, but I need to figure out why they put that in the first place, if there's a good reason. My guess is that TBTK doesn't work on certain platforms, and they want to keep it out of those platforms. Um, there's some distro image-based configs that are sh that really should be in distro or image, and they're shoved into local conf. And then I need to clean up and release this. But right now, it's on Pocky config set, or Pocky contrib, so you can take a look at it. All right, now for the demo stuff, which is uh, flying without trap or without net. Um, I'm going to do a quick layer walkthrough, show how we do uh, pre-population of containers, then we're going to bring up QEMU with an LX with an LXC container, set up huge table FS, uh, and then we're going to run test PMD, which is the DPDK uh, test of the pull mode driver on the host and the guest to prove that hey, Vert IO and the host user are working. And then uh, we're not going to do container to container IPC because my hard drive ran out of space, so my image was too big to be able to generate it. So, but what we will show is one container coming up and vhost user and vert.io being able to talk to each other. Um, that's one of the things about uh, um, do it, doing builds this size where you have multi containers within a root FS, sometimes the uh, size of the images could be fairly, fairly large. All right. So let's start with the tree of what we have here. And can folks see this OK or should I make it larger? OK, yeah, this is pretty good. So it's not that difficult of a layer. You have an LXC config class, which basically generates the uh, container configs for LXC. Um, and I'll show you the fragments that we use for this. There's a mount fragment, there's a network fragment, and this basically goes into the LXC config. Um, and then we have the multi-config stuff, which basically says, hey, bring all these fragments together. Um, there's some, uh, yeah, these are all the uh, config fragments there. Um, then we have the guest images, and we have a generic one, you know, guest image minimal and host image, or LXC host image minimal, and those are our base images, and then we have guest image dbdk demo and host image dbdk, and this is what we kind of generate these off of. So we can take a look at this. This is the... Um, minimal container host image that we're pulling it off of. In this piece, chunk of Python, is the stuff that says, hey, these are our container dependencies, what we're depending on in order to do root FS. So we need to um, go and wait for the do image complete of the container in order to be able to continue on with the build. And this is the install stuff. And if you notice, um, there's a lot of things that are kind of hard-coded, guest image minus. And this is some of what we've been talking about, how to make this more generic that we can upstream this to the Octo project. Um, because right now, this is kind of very AGL-based. 
Um, you know, stripping out all of this and making it less AGL based wasn't that difficult, but doing this the right way to get it upstream to the project is going to take a little bit of effort. And one of the first things now on my to do is to talk to Bruce and say, hey, Bruce, uh, about those patches you've been working on, do you want to talk about these? Um, because I would really like to see this in upstream. Um, And here's the LXE uh, config BB class. So <laughs> the, 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 thank you, Scott. It, Scott must be like tripping out seeing his code up here <laughs> because this is literally ripped from AGL, um, which I think got ripped from Oryx, actually. So, you know, this is kind of funny. What? Did you, you, you wrote all this? Okay, excellent. Um, so, you obviously see recipe name is assumed to be LXE minus config guest name, and we don't really want to have that as a thing. Um, it's good for, for what Scott needed it for and what, for why I needed it for, but for more generic uses, we kind of got to go in through here and figure this all out. And then here's our little config fragment set, build the LXE config, which in the which in DPTK looks like this. So here's our mount entry for system.conf, which is empty. Here's our mount entry for huge pages and for the Unix socket where our control path is going to be. So basically, data path, control path. And then this is the... Uh, AGL container conf within the uh, layer. So the important thing here is, oh, here you can see we're using Linux, don't, don't mean for the kernel because containers don't have kernels. Same with the device tree. Um, same with the RNGD. And then host name append AGL container DBDK. Oh, we're appending this at the end of this, which is, again, one of these things that we need to make more generic and not have hard-coded things in here. And then here's the guest multi-config, where, again, Linux dummy, blah, 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 serial container, and then we're ripping out some of the ARM-trusted firmware and stuff like that. So let's see what this actually looks like. Let's do it without capital letters, though. Yes, we're doing this through run QEMU, so it's literally the host user and bird IO all the way down. Um, So um, instead of me having to uh, type all this in, um, I was smart and put the script actually in the build. So we can actually see how we're starting this all up. So from the host side, what we're doing is we're making sure the container stop. Now, I had it on auto stop. I turned that off because it kind of screwed some things up. Um, so we're stopping the container, we're unmounting huge pages, making sure that's unmounted. And we're creating the mount, we're turning huge pages on, which I really could have done within the kernel config, and I just didn't feel like doing it. Um, and then we're running dptk. Uh, and we're setting the socket memory, we're telling it vdev is going to be a vhost with the interface, is going to be var run dptk0, that's our unit socket that we're going to do. I, I don't, oh, yeah, there we go. Can folks see that? Can you, can you see that, Kevin? All right. Okay. Um, so that's Unix socket, and then we're pointing it to the huge pages uh, directory, uh, and that's how we're going to run. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to run this. And... Announce it and now test that PMD is up, which is great. So now we're going to go 
over to the serial console here. We're going to start the container. Now we're on the container. So we're going to take a look at the guest uh, script. And actually, I should do one thing before we do this. Um, we're saying start a virtio user uh, virtual device. The uh, path for the socket is going to be mount dptk0, which we're mounting it um, from the host, host uh, OS. And then we're pointing to where we've mounted huge pages to var dptk huge pages. So, now we're going to let that run for a second, and this should see in a second. All right, there we go. Um, so it sees var run dbtk0, the host socket has a new vhost user connection. Um, it's reading it. Um, it does all the negotiation and sets up the vring call. And now we should be able to pass packets back and forth. Asterisk, except I didn't put a package uh, generator on, or a packet generator on this because the DPTK uh, recipe doesn't contain it for some reason. So um, what we can do here, though, is show that. Forwarding actually works. Now we've dropped it, dropped a bunch of packets because we didn't have it set up on the host side and would have to set that up on the host side, but we were actually able to forward packets. So now if we had two containers, we can forward set up an entire container system where we do the IPC through there, except I ran out of space for two containers. So conclusions. Is it faster? Yes, but. Um, so this is directly from the DBTK documentation. It's really not that different because you're basically exposing all of memory to user space. Root privilege is a must. TBDK resolves physical addresses of huge pages, which seems not necessary, and some discussions are on to remove this restriction. Where those discussions are, I don't know. Um, but this is also a problem with other SIT setups similar to this. Is it worth it? Maybe, but. This is very specific fringe use cases. Am I going to set up vhost user for my I2C temp sensor? Sure. Am I running the space shuttle? Outside of that, you know, I get the temp from a few microseconds ago. It doesn't matter as much. So this is very specific for I need a lot of data right now. It needs to be as fast as possible. Outside of that, there are probably better ways to do this. And there might even be better ways to do that inside of that as well. Uh, Scott and I were having lunch yesterday talking about some of those ways. So um, I have a really long thank you list here uh, that I want to go through. Uh, if you want to contact me, pitch at pitch.org, pitch at baylibra.com. Uh, the meta LXCDBTK layer is out there. It's not updated yet. I should probably uh, be able to do that this weekend. Um, there's a lot of people I want to thank for this because when I got thrown this project, I had, I'm like, Vertio is for VMs. Why do I care about this? And a lot of the, the kind of catching up I had to do, uh, Red Hat has a good seri series on vhost and Vertio. Oracle actually has a really good series of Vertio. Um, this guy, Jay Coward, did this uh, entire 
uh, blog post and video on NVIDIA GPU pass through through LXC. It's insane, um, but it's really cool. Uh, Dr. Luca Abini uh, did uh, an entire thing on LXC and DBDK. And thank you for Scott Murray and Paul Barker for the MC container work because uh, that's something I've been wanting forever. So the next thing is questions. Thank you. Uh, did I get that right? So vHost uh, provides a VetIO net device and uh, DBTK implements a user space driver for VetIO net in each of the two containers. So, so the way I, from how I understand it, and again, I'm not a hypervisor developer, is the way this works is that you have a vHost uh, front end and a VO's back end. The back end sits in, in the host operating system user space and the front end sits in within the guest OS. Uh, and how DBDK, from my understanding, works is that um, the, uh, the um, front end is, is in the guest and the back end is in the host. And it's basically using huge tables as its data path and Unix sockets as its control. Does that make sense? I am wondering why not use normal POSIX shared memory between those two containers? <laughs> um, so the argument, and, and I don't necessarily, is that, oh, syscalls and context switching are expensive. But it's shared memory. Once you have set I, that, it up, the, it's the, there. I, I am saying the argument. I do not necessarily agree with that argument. Um, Fair enough. I think, so if you look at DBDK, DBDK and like a lot of this work is being done around like OpenV switch and the OpenVBP project and uh, that FDIO is doing. And I think this is very network specific where they're trying to squeeze every second or every millisecond of latency out of getting packets from point A to point B. Um, and I think that's where a lot of this work has come from. Um, and from an embedded sit developer standpoint, I'm going to be honest, uh, you know, like two, two microsecond, two milliseconds, three milliseconds, yeah, whatever. Um, but I think for very, very specific use cases that need that latency or that low latency, yeah, this is where people are looking. Yeah, I see the utility if, if you like do packet switching user space or something. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. Between exactly. two containers, it's, yeah, it's no a argument okay. there. <laughs> it, well, it, again, if I'm sending a lot of data from point A to point B, and I'm doing a lot of data forward, it, it, yeah, maybe, right? But I do think that there are probably better ways to do this. Um, but yeah, thank you. So uh, on Vert.io, and I mean, we're talking about memory sharing, and, and just to be clear, Vert.io is just, is just memory sharing. There's nothing else. It's sharing packets between uh, an application and, and QMU, usually. But yeah. So the, the, the big advantage of using Vert.io, in my opinion, in what you, you presented, is the fact that Vert.io is a protocol on top of this memory sharing, sharing mechanism. And with Vert.io, you see networking interface popping up, and you guessed, magically. Or, or GPUs, or, or disks, yeah. or uh, RNG, uh, or entropy. Because the, ver the whole Vert Vert.io main point is to define uh, a kind of a hardware emulation protocol on top of this memory sharing mechanism. So uh, to me, it makes what you're describing makes a lot of sense, because if it, it's great from a container to be able to see hardware that actually is not on the host. It, it opens up for a lot, of, uh, a lot of different use cases. And I actually have a question. Sure. <laughs> My question is how, uh, I mean, have you considered uh, uh, kind of porting this to uh, Docker or Runcy, <laughs> whatever? 
um, <laughs> which is which is I understand. It, it unfortunately is quite different from from LXC. No, 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 no. no. It, see, okay. Um, I was talking the people who asked me to 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 hey, can you do this for containers? I said yes. Why don't you use Docker? Um, and they're like, no, it has to be LXC. Um, there are folks who are already doing it for Docker. Uh, I know DPDK does have Docker examples, uh, for yeah. example. Um, the only person I've seen this doing it for LXC is um, that uh, uh, the one guy who's doing LXC and DPDK and the other guy who's doing GPU jet pass through through LXC. I don't think anyone that, that I do not disagree that Docker or or in my opinion, run C, yeah. OCI runtimes would have been better. But I was asked to do it in LXC, so I did in LXC. Sure. No. So um, I guess my question is more, um, um, how, how difficult do you think it would be to, to actually Trivial. Port? Okay. Trivial. Trivial. I, I, know, I know for a fact that uh, the DBTK folks have a Docker example. Um, so doing... Hey, that, like one of the things that I wanted to do and I didn't get time to do it is the um, Stratos Rust uh, vHost device uh, uh, bits. They have back end drivers written, but no front ends because generally the front end is, is QEMU is the front end, right? Yeah. Um, and I want to take some of the QEMU front end work and bring it over into LXC. Um, I just didn't have time to do it. Well, not LXC, but y you know what I mean. You know yeah. what I mean. Um, so where I can actually do like the host device I square C pass through between the host container and the uh, uh, or the host and the guest container. Okay. Just uh, one one last word on on Vertio. Something that I find I find really uh, kind of fascinating is some we, we are seeing now hardware uh, vendors, silicon vendors uh, for devices that are exposing their devices on PCI buses as Vertio devices. So mm -hmm. they implement yeah. Vertio in hardware, and instead of using their, their native driver on the host, yeah. they actually are bound to Vertio drivers on the host instead of uh, uh, on the yeah, guest VM. You're talking about BDPA, right? Uh, for example. Yeah, and, yeah. But, but I, we are seeing I entirely silicon vendors. That point. So VDPA is actually kind of cool. It's Vertio yeah. on the hardware. Yes. Um, and that brings in, like you said, some really interesting things. Um, I think some of those interesting things would be solved better if some hardware vendors upstream their code. But, um, you but, know. Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. Like all, all NIC vendors would switch to a, a Vertio, and I mean, the, we would have like one single networking driver for a bunch of vendors. And, and, I'm yeah, but you, but now now I have a, 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 okay. I'm I'm putting on my open source evangelist hat, but now I have a bunch of of VDPA that I don't have the source code to. Yeah. Scott, are you going to troll me? No, I was just going to sorry okay. just follow yeah. up a little bit on that. So. Um, the a part of the reason why you, uh, she had to do LXC is because there are AGL member companies that basically have picked LXC as something they're going to use for product, so OEMs in cars. Um, and you know, I personally in meetings in AGL argued against it <laughs> myself. Um, so it is basically gets you know companies make these decisions and you know we kind of have to live with them yeah. uh, but to expand a little bit on the vert io as an abstraction thing um, there's actually work going on in agl right now which i also am a little not confident in but in that direction to actually do loopback so you can actually run vert io on a native host and have it your software stack uses vert io devices and run the host backends basically in the same system. Um, and the argument is for basically building your images so that you can like test in the cloud and take it and put it on hardware without changing anything. 
Um, I'm a little dubious on the performance front with some of this stuff, especially now they're expanding that to try and do loop back of more and more types of devices. But if you're interested in that type of thing, that's there's ongoing work in AGL. The, uh, uh, virtual open systems are doing some development there. Um, yeah, with the performance stuff, you know, I'm not a security person. Um, well, no, let me rephrase that. I like breaking things. So on the on red team, I don't care about, about closing them up. Um, is it faster? Yes. But on the same token, I can throw a Volkswagen bus out of an airplane, and it's going to go faster. It is going to go faster for exactly 20,000 feet. Um, so is it faster? Yeah. Yeah. But at what, and this is what I came to, at what cost? Um, and part of me would make the argument that if it's an embedded device I have physical access to, then, you know, at that point, it's insecure anyway. But that's whatever, right? Thank you. That's not.